Uh, we thank you for joining us for today for the for the free wheat webinar, Collection Systems Pumping, Why Pumps Break, and How to Diagnose Pump Performance Issues in the Field. Uh, I'm Logan Burton with LNV and the subcommittee chair for Wheat's Collection Systems Committee, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. We have two speakers today. Uh, David Shank with Burgess and Nifel has a presentation titled 50 Ways to Break a Pump, and James Mansfield with Pump Solutions has a presentation titled Diagnosing a Pump's Performance in the Field. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, James Mansfield. Mr. Mansfield joined Pump Solutions, Inc. in 2008 after graduating from Texas A&M University with an industrial distribution degree from the College of Engineering. Pump Solutions, Inc. is a municipal equipment distributor with a focus on water and wastewater pumps, controls, pumping packages, polymer concrete wet wells, odor control, and other equipment for the municipal industry. At Pump Solutions, Mr. Mansfield has been responsible for and assisted in the engineering of hundreds of new and or modified pump stations with many different sizes uh, of water and wastewater applications. Mr. Mansfield is a member of AWWA, Wheat, and Austin Contractors and Engineers Association. He has served different positions in these organizations and most recently was the president of the capital area of AWWA in 2015. He was awarded the Maverick Award, Maverick Award uh, through Wheat and AWWA in 2013, which is given to a young professional each year for exemplifying exceptional qualities in volunteerism, community involvement, leadership, and outstanding service. And I'm going to pass the controls on over to James now. Hello, everyone. My presentation today is titled How to Diagnose Pump Performance Issues in the Field. And this is a picture of a, a lift station pump. Here's an operator access hatch here. This is a pump that had about 10 feet of rags hanging off of it on the bottom. And while my presentation today will be about 25 minutes, I don't think I'll have enough time to teach everyone how to prevent this from happening, but I wanted to share this picture to see what pumps can look like in the real world. My presentation will be quite a few pictures from the field, and I'll also show different ways of how to troubleshoot pumps in the field. Primarily, I'm going to be talking about lift station pumps, Here's a typical lift station type setups here with the pump goes up and down a guide cable or a rail system. Here's your piping in the wet well, base elbow that the pump sits on, um, and lifting devices with the pumps so these pumps can be lifted out. Here's a lift station with a baffle wall. So primarily I'm going to be talking about lift station type pumps for submersible pumps. So how to diagnose pump performance issues in the field. The two topics I'll go into today is the pump isn't pumping as much as it used to, and also how to troubleshoot, including field measured readings. So the pump isn't pumping as much as it used to. What could cause this? It has to be the low bid crummy pump brand that the developer put in. Now, while there is some truth to that, I'm gonna show why show quite a few reasons why a pump won't pump as much as it used to in the field and how to troubleshoot the causes. Some of the main items I will cover is the pump is clogged, the pump is airlocked, you have a faulty or leaking check valve, the impeller is worn, or the pump is not seating properly. And note that all five of these items typically result in the motor amps being lower than usual and higher run times. Clog pump, first item here is the exception with amps being higher or lower depending on the location of the debris in the pump. So first item is your pump is clogged. On the left here we have clogs in the pump, meaning what I mean by that is blockages in the pump that prevent the pump from flowing as much water. The other type of clog that's pretty common is clog and wear rings. Wear rings are like brake pad systems in a pump. And the next slide will show what, what these look like up close. 
but typically if you have a clog in your pump, uh, meaning a blockage, your amps are typically lower than normal because you're not pumping as much water, so you have less horsepower needed. And then one way to determine if you have a blockage in the pump or this type of clog is to check your shutoff pressure. I'll show how to do that as well. Clog and wear rings, typically your amps are higher than normal, and that is because you're closer to your locked rotor amps. Locked rotor amps mean that basically your impeller and your wear rings, your wear rings in here have gotten jammed up to a point where your shaft is having trouble spinning. And that means your pump is trying, your motor's trying harder to pump. And so almost like a brake pad system, um, as these get these wear rings close up on each other based on the rag debris, the rags and debris in there, you have higher amps. This is what wear rings look like in a pump. Here's an exploded view here. Here's a typical submersible pump with your motor, your shaft, bearings, mechanical seals, impeller, balut, uh, other items in here. Here's your discharge elbow that the pump sits on. The impeller wear rings, or the two wear rings rather, sorry, look like this here. This would be in your impeller here. This is your impeller wear ring. This is your casing or your volute. Then there's also a casing wear ring here. And so there's a there's a gap set by the manufacturers. Uh, typically the tolerance is about 10 thousandths clearance. As you have debris coming through your pump and these clearances get larger, what happens then is your pump is less efficient, so it's going to run longer. And it's not going to be pumping as much as it used to. And you have leakage between your wear rings. So you have high pressure here, low pressure. As these gaps open up, you have um, less efficiency here where you have leakage. One thing to remember is while there's no universal tire, meaning you wouldn't put a bicycle tire on a tractor, it's also important to note that when you're looking at different impellers from different types of manufacturers, and these are some of the common ones um, from different manufacturers, it's important to make sure you select the right impeller for the right type of sewage. Uh, for instance, if you had a lift station at a jail, you wouldn't want to use a, a small solids handling pump. You don't want to have, typically have something that is going to handle lots of solids and debris. The next item is your pump is airlocked. These show pretty common ways that you can get air in pumps and, and something other than a submersible pump. Like here in a pump that's pulling a prime, you wanna make sure to have eccentric reducers. You wanna have this, this pipe coming into the pump suction here, either be slightly at an incline or be flat, not shown the other way. Um, if you had a concentric reducer here, you'd have an air pocket. This just shows that you wanna have good velocity coming in the pump and you wanna prevent air coming into the pump. And a dry pit pump, same idea. You're going to have a slight incline or a flat pipe here coming to the pump, flat on the top side to prevent air from coming in the pump. Another way pumps are airlocked is through vortexing. If your submergence isn't enough over your pump or your priming type pump here, you can have vortexing, uh, which are air bubbles that get into your pump. What this chart shows here is as your flow increases, so as you're pumping more water, you need more submergence. So the more flow you're pumping, you need more submergence to, create, to prevent that vortexing from happening. Another example is of how pumps get airlocked. Here's a lift station with the uh, influent water coming right on top of the pump. What happens there is you have splashing, you have air that gets into your pump. Another common issue here is concrete too close to your pumps. So when flow comes in, uh, the air bubbles don't get out of the water and they get it straight in your pump. And typical indications for both these types of, or for getting air in your pump is indicated by your amp readings being much lower than normal. You can eliminate this as a possibility by checking shutoff pressure or manually bleeding air from your valve bolt or your force main or inspecting your air release valves. If they're not working properly, that could be a reason. Another thing you can do is if the lift station is designed properly, you could have a baffle plate in here that helps prevent that air from getting into the pump. So this water would come in here, hit a baffle wall, and then flow down slower to the pump. This is what impellers look like if they are pumping water with air in them over time. What happens whenever you pump air is you have air bubbles 
when your pressure increases and whenever those air bubbles turn to a liquid state, they burst. And whenever these air bubbles burst, they pit away at your impeller and eventually they can look like Swiss cheese. But here's an idea of what impellers can look like from uh, being airlocked or pumping air. Faultier leaking check valve is another reason why pumps aren't pumping as much as they used to. This would be valve vault here, valve vault wet well here. For instance, if this check valve was failing while this pump was running, you'd have flow coming out through the pump, going out to your force mate. You'd also have flow coming back through this pump. So your pump would run longer because it's not getting all the flow through the force main. Same idea here. If you have flow coming through this pump, this check valve's leaking by or faulty, you have flow going through your force main and then flow coming back here. A way to check this or an indicator is your amps are lower than normal because your pump is uh, not having to, it's flowing quite a, a bit more water than it used to. For instance, if your pressure was higher here, your pump is leaking, your check valve is leaking by here, so your pump's able to flow more, so your amps will be lower, and I'll show why that is a little bit later. You can eliminate this as a possibility by checking shutoff pressure or running both pumps together, because if you run both pumps simultaneously, um, you'd be able to check amps and compare that to your startup report and see if it's a faulty check valve or not. Other thing you can do is run your pump above ground if you, if you pull the pump and just bump it and make sure you don't have a motor problem. Here's an example of an impeller being worn. This is an old impeller and a new impeller here. This pump was running for a long, long, long time with uh, was so clogged up. And it was running for a long time to the point that the impeller looked like this. It was so worn out. Uh, that's another reason why your pump will pump a lot longer than it used to, or it's not pumping as much, just because your impellers are worn. That's also indicated by your amps being lower because it's not pumping as much water. The other thing you can do is check shutoff pressure and compare it to the startup. What I'm trying to explain here is there's a lot of ways uh, and indicators to, uh, lots of ways to check to see how your pump is performing without having to pull your pump. And so checking shutoff pressure or checking amps is a way to check it without pulling your pump. The, the next item is your pump is not seating properly. Here's an example of a lift station where the pump discharge fitting stayed here, but the pump went this way. It essentially jumped out of the volute. So this pump wasn't pumping nearly, not really anything. It wasn't pumping as much as it used to. What happened here is whenever this pump wasn't seating properly, it eventually jumped out of its volute and um, essentially jumped up out of the water and ruined this pump's power cord. So that's what it looked like from not seating properly. Another thing to check is some manufacturers use a metal on metal uh, sealing between the pump and the elbow. Some manufacturers use a gasket. Uh, the pump's not seating properly. You can have a, a gasket or metal on metal flange that's leaking by and that can cause your pump to not pump as much as it used to. So that's something to check. That's also indicated by amps lower than normal. Um, you can check shutoff pressure or pump your wet well down to inspect. Uh, no entry uh, is needed into the wet well. You can also see water swirling in the wet well. I'm sorry, that's a typo there. Actually, that one, your amps will be higher if, you're, um, if your gasket's torn. The next segment is how to troubleshoot, including field measured readings. You can check running amps, um, show you how to measure total dynamic head, how to measure shutoff pressure. And then other electrical items typically are usually more than 50% of the reason why you're out there troubleshooting a pump. So check running amps. What I want to show here is this is a example of a page three out of a report from a startup report. Um, this shows mega readings for the motor, both unloaded and loaded voltages. And then these are amp draws of the pump. This is a this was a three phase motor and so there's an A, B, and C phase. Here's pump one, pump two, and here's readings with both pumps running together. It's important to, whenever a pump is first started up, first installed, to fill up the force main and get these readings so that when you compare them later, you can see if you have any of the things I referred to earlier, a faulty check valve, uh, air in the pump, things like that. You'll see here when two pumps are running, uh, this is one pump running by itself, 
pump two running by itself. When both pumps running together, your amps per pump are lower because when you flow more water, your head increases and it backs you on the left side of the curve. High amps typically indicate, like I mentioned earlier, clog in the wear rings or an empty force main. And then low amps are typically, uh, typically indicate blockage in the impeller eye. Voltage indicates power quality, your power quality at the site from your energy company and a possible phase imbalance. Important to note that most pump manufacturers have a voltage and phase imbalance allowance tolerance, and it's important to stay within that tolerance or else, you're, um, or else you need to contact the power company to get it fixed, or else um, the manufacturer won't, won't cover warranty if you're above that imbalance rating that they have. Here's how you measure total dynamic head in the field. It's the same slide from earlier, but imagine the pump sitting here on the elbow. Here would be your water level, and here's a pressure gauge. A, a just diagram here, essentially you would want to mount this pressure gauge not in your wet well, but in your valve vault. Um, this is done a lot of times to figure out when you're troubleshooting a pump what pressure you're actually running at. So if you mount a pressure gauge here, I'm going to give you an example, in a submersible lift station, if you show 20 psi on the gauge while your pump is running and 20 feet from your water level to your gauge, this is 20 feet, you can measure that with a tape measure from your gauge to your water level while the pump is running, what is your TDH? The TDH would be 20 PSI times 2.31 to convert PSI to feet. That gets you 46.2 feet. Then you have to add in your static lift in feet, which is your water level to your gauge, which gives you 66.2 feet. This helps give you an indication of why your pump isn't performing like it should be. It could show you that there's a blockage in your force main or your pump is airlocked or different things like that too. It's important to, to note that pressure and flow are directly related in a, in a pump. So it's important to check pressure when troubleshooting a pump. Feet of head, just an example that shows different specific gravities about how your pressure is related to equates to feet of head. For water and wastewater, for, for wastewater rather, for collection systems we're talking about today, we use a specific gravity of one. Uh, this just shows that if your specific gravity changes, your pressure also changes. Uh, here's the equation I used earlier. Head and feet of liquid is your gauge reading times 2.31 over your specific gravity. So in the equation earlier, I showed 20 PSI times 2.31, and I didn't show the specific gravity because I just used a specific gravity of one. Specific gravity is the ratio of density to of a liquid to density of water. And like I said, we use one in this example. So shutoff pressure here, these curves show different ways of how to get more flow or head with the same system head curve. Um, for instance, what I'm going to show first is shutoff head. Uh, this example would be your shutoff head is 100 PSI. That equates to 231 feet. So same same example here, what you do is you take 100 PSI and multiply it by 2.31 and you get 231 feet. In the same example earlier, if you were measuring this in the field, what you would do is your, um, you'd compare your pump curve here. Um, if, you're, if you're measuring this in the field, what you would do is get your pressure reading, which in this case, if you had 231 feet or 100 PSI, you're, in the same example as earlier, when you have 20 foot of static, from your water level to your gauge, your gauge pressure would actually be 91.3 PSI. Another note here, check shutoff. When you check shutoff pressure, that will help troubleshoot a bad check valve issue. If you were to throttle the gate valve and check pressures, this shows how when you eventually close the gate valve, your pump is running, your pressure increases. And in a standard centrifugal pump, your shutoff pressure is the max pressure that your pump can ever put out. It won't increase pressure over time and just keep keep pressure, pressure, pressure till the line blows. Your the max pressure that, that pump can reach is at zero flow here. So this is flow and head. As you increase head, you're decreasing flow. So you increase head, you're decreasing flow, 
that also decreases your motor horsepower and centrifugal pump. That's why when you pump more water, you're pulling more amps and you require more horsepower and centrifugal pump. This just shows a larger impeller versus smaller impeller. Obviously smaller impeller, less flow, less head. Uh, VFDs, which David will get into a little bit later. Um, higher RPM versus lower RPM, it shows when you slow the pump down, you get less flow and head. Other electrical items I'm gonna to touch on. Here's a typical pump curve. This shows a horsepower curve for a pump. Like I explained earlier, as your flow increases, your horsepower and also essentially your amps readings will increase. Another note is it's important to make sure when you're looking at a pump curve to make sure that the motor horsepower covers the curve. At this point here, the motor would be in the service factor. And that's why there's a dash line here. This pump has a shutoff of 231 head feet ahead or 100 PSI. That's what that looks like. So if you're comparing this in the field and you get 100 PSI shutoff head on your readings, then that means that your pump is not clogged, for instance. This shows a bigger pump here. And what, what I just wanted to show here is this is a 800 horsepower sewage pump with a minimum flow of 6,000 gallons per minute. That means this pump needs at least 6,000 gallons per minute to be happy. Uh, that's the minimum flow. One thing I wanna note here, and the reason I put it in here is big pumps have the same characteristics of small pumps. So it's important to note that when you're in the field troubleshooting a pump, if it's a little pump or a big pump, it's important to note, you know, to not get anxious or get worried about it because Small pumps have the same characteristics as big pumps. It's a big pump or small pump, it's still a pump. I'm talking about other electrical still here. These are starters and control panels. This shows two different NEMA starters here. Some starters in your control panel have heaters. This is what a heater looks like in the bottom of the starter. There's three heaters here, and these have codes on them. Like this, this one's square D, this will have like B14, and you look it up in a book and it gives you the uh, heater rating. Some starters have adjustable overloads, which is a, essentially a dial that allows the operator to adjust the amperage setting by changing this dial. One of the drawbacks of these that we see a whole lot is whenever the, um, the amperage setting is cranked up to its highest, sometimes you get nuisance alarms. Um, and your starter trip. So this type of starter allows the operator to crank up the amp setting to the largest possible, which could, um, when it's not adjusted properly, can help, um, it, it can burn up the pump essentially. This shows how, what I'm gonna give you an example here is um, how to set this dial. So here's a, some pump information here. Here's full load amps, here's service factor amps. These dials here, it's hard to see, but uh, I wrote them in here. There's a A, B, C, or D setting here. And then um, this is what these, these readouts mean. So there's this pump here is a full load amp of 38.9 amps. Service factor amp is 45.9. I put this slide in here just to show that it's important to set the dial at your, at or just above your full load amp setting. You don't wanna be setting your dial here or you don't want to set your uh, overamp circuit anything higher than your full load amps. That's what the manufacturers um, require. This is last slide here, I believe. This slide here just shows that uh, electrical issues typically make up well over 50% of the reason to troubleshoot a pump. And I'll give you a picture of what an electrical problem looks like. This is a control panel that was backed over by a trunk, or sorry, by a truck rather, and this caused um, pump failures. And that's a very extreme electrical um, problem there, but something you see in the field quite often, unfortunately. And that concludes my presentation. Here's my contact information. I'll give it back to Logan. All right, thank you, James. <clears throat> And now I'll introduce our second presenter, Mr. David Shank, who's, who's got a presentation titled 50 Ways to Break a Pump. Mr. Shank joined Burgess and Nipple in 1991 and is the firm's utility infrastructure technical leader. He provides technical direction to key projects 
and quality control for water and wastewater projects firm-wide. His background includes 39 years of experience as a civil and sanitary consulting engineer and water and wastewater treatment equipment manufacturer. Mr. Shank is board certified by the American Academy of Environmental Engineers in Water Supply Wastewater, and he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Ohio Northern University, a Master of Science degree in Sanitary Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, and an MBA in Finance from Georgia State University. Mr. Shank is a life member of AWWA and has, a, has been a member of WEF for 40 years. In 2010, the Ohio WEA awarded Mr. Shank their Lifetime Engineering Achievement Award. And now I'll pass the controls over to David. Thank you very much. Uh, this talk is really a storytelling of things that have gone wrong with actual pump stations uh, that I've seen over the, I hate to say it, 40 years that I've been doing this. Today we'll look at issues of vibration, both cavitation and other ways of creating vibration. We'll look at um, what I'll say the whole system, looking at the piping, not just the pumps. Uh, we'll look at missing the pump curve and we'll look at some power and control issues. The, the first issue is net positive suction head and James has touched on that. Um, there, there are two terms that get confused, net positive suction head available. That's a characteristic of the setting in which you put the pump. Um, net positive suction head required is a characteristic of the pump and you have to ask the manufacturer for it. If you're not going to cavitate your pump, net positive suction head available must be greater than net positive suction head required. So how do we calculate net positive suction head available? It's this formula. We're going to sum up atmospheric pressure. If you're in Houston, you can use sea level. If you're at 3,500 feet in El Paso, don't use sea level. Use your actual average local atmospheric pressure. Um, the vertical distance. Um, this is the head of water over the center line of the pump. If you have a section, suction draw, this is a negative number. Make sure you get the sign on that right. The friction on the suction piping, you add a velocity head and you subtract the vapor pressure. So generally, you're going to have here on the bottom a curve that increases toward the right, which is the net positive suction head required. The higher your flow rate, the more suction head you're going to need. And conversely, the net positive suction head available is going to fall off as you move to the right on the curve. Where they cross, you can carry that dashed line up onto your pump curve. To the left of it, the pump won't cavitate. To the right of that dashed line, the pump will cavitate. This I, I didn't used to see a lot of net positive suction head problems. I'm seeing an increasing number of them, and I will tell you that our young engineers do not understand this concept. Um, I see the results of every question on the PE exam, and net positive suction head questions are not being correctly answered. This is a pump station. It was an influence station that had a, a kind of a four bay that had several pipes come into it through a screen and then into a, a pump well. It was built to take six pumps. They only installed four initially. I was tasked with adding the fifth pump and we discovered that it couldn't be done because the person that designed the station originally designed it at average conditions. He thought about what's my typical water level, what's my typical pump rate. You've got to know what your critical design condition is. In this case, it would be when I'm at low flow and when I've got multiple pumps running and drawing this down, a dirty screen adds to head loss. I, I think the key question here is know what the critical design condition is and pay attention to it. One of my recurring themes about pump stations is there's nothing wrong with this station that having dug another five feet wouldn't have solved. And this is one of those stations. If they built this station five feet deeper, it would have worked. Um, something we're doing a lot these days with pump stations is the bigger pump. We built back in the 70s or 80s a pump station to serve 
a treatment plant or a lift station out in the collection system, the community's grown, our solution is let's put in a bigger pump. Um, and you can do it successfully, you can do it unsuccessfully. In this case, they decided to double the size of this pump. When they did, that caused the wet well level to be drawn down, and you can begin to see that the wet well surface is approximately the same as the center line of the pump. The inlet channel um, is a rectangular section reducing in size as it approaches the pump. It makes more than a 90 degree turn and then goes to a circular section. With the little pump, this worked. The velocity going into the volute was 5.6 feet per second. When they doubled that pump, it was 13.2 feet per second, fully turbulent, and this pump cavitated. They didn't have enough suction head. So we got to this lift station, which the utility had numbered 504. Um, one of our offices was tasked with putting on bigger pumps, and when they started it up, it vibrated and I got asked to take a look at it. And I saw this and I said, guys, you didn't. But in fact, they didn't. They did not draw down the wet well. You've got a positive head going into the pump. The inlet pipe is smooth, long radius bend. The velocities were still okay. This pump is not cavitating, but we did have a lot of vibration. So we started looking for reasons. We began to focus on the plate it was sitting on as not being stiff enough. I'd seen this before where you basically had a pump sitting on a bouncing plate. So we proposed to the owner that we lift off a pump, stiffen the plate, and reassemble it to see what would happen. Um, as you saw in the picture, this is in an enclosed area. We had their crane operator come in who wasn't having his best day, and when he lifted the pump, he did this. He hit one of the pedestals and knocked it off. But that was a good thing because we discovered the problem. The design drawings had called for the new pedestals to be dialed into the mass block 18 inches. They, in fact, because there was no construction inspection going on, were only dialed in three inches and the pedestals were not connected to the mass block. We removed the pedestals, correctly installed them, and the vibration went away. Uh, this is a non-potable water system at a wastewater plant. It was two small vertical turbine pumps going out to the plant. Worked well. It was designed to operate between 80 and 100 PSI, um, except at night, the pumps tended to deadhead when there was very little non-potable usage, and they were breaking pipes because the pipes were used to a non-potable system at about 65 PSI. So to solve this, someone decided to add a 3,000-gallon hydropneumatic tank. That let the pumps cycle against the big tank. The controls person said, I'll fix the pressure problem by changing my operating range from what was originally 80 to 100 PSI down to about 65 to 80. Unfortunately, let's move to the bottom graph and remember what we learned about net positive suction head. This pump now cavitates all the time it's operating. In this case, if the controls person had talked to the pump person, they would have realized the problem. But those two disciplines didn't communicate and we wound up with a pump that cavitated. Um, I was doing a forensic study on this and our solution was to take one um, one stage off of the pumps and, and run it as a two-stage pump. This is um, what I call false cavitation. Um, this is the non-potable water system at Houston's Southwest Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, this, this is a station I designed. Had lots of suction head. We'd done the net positive suction head calculations. This shouldn't have been a problem, but when we started it up, these pumps shook more violently than I had ever seen a pump shake. And we worked quite a while trying to figure out why that might be. These pumps are about 40 feet down on the ground and to get over to the wet well side, you've got to go up up into the filter structure and then down into the effluent pump station. It's, it's a long hike up and a long hike down. But one day I did that and this is what I saw. The effluent channel from the filter structure was cascading over where directly on top of my suction bell. 
I wasn't cavitating these pumps because I wasn't pulling gas out of solution, but I rather I was drawing entrained air in and it had the same effect. There were bubbles and they exploded when they got compressed. Our solution to this was we added three air release valves down the suction piping and this uh, pump station worked fine. I want to look at the entire system for a moment. Um, this is a location where it's, it's actually uh, pumping over a flood levee. Um, they were supposed to be pumping 35 MTD. I was doing an asset inventory at this facility. As I got looking at these, I realized that these four pumps, although rated for a total of 35 MTD, would only pump about 30. I brought that to the owner's attention. He went back to the original designer who said, okay, we'll add a fifth pump. Um, when they turned on all five pumps, they still pumped 30 MGD because the problem wasn't the pumps. The problem was this vertical drop shaft in the middle of the levee. It was, you couldn't push any more water through that vertical fall. So how might they have solved this? Let's increase that vertical fall. Let's let water come out of both ends of the pump header, go to a new manhole on the right end, and then you can take a pipe, and that can actually slope pretty close to minimum grade, minimum cover, down to a manhole on the outside face of the levee, and then come back over to the outfall pipe that was sufficiently large. This would have been a cheaper solution. It would have worked, and it would have been cheaper to operate because you'd still be pumping with four pumps instead of five pumps. Um, this is inside of a wastewater plant. This is um, two clarifiers going to two return activated sludge pumps. They are absolutely parallel. When you walk around the plant, you go, there is no difference. But the upper clarifier and pump worked and the lower one didn't. This is a 1MGD treatment plant that was built to service a large industry that never showed up. And the plant's running at about one-tenth of an MGD, so 10% of capacity. So they've got everything turned way down. What we found was in this lower pump, that vertical pipe section, the flow rate was, the velocity was less than one foot per second. And this basically turned into a settling column. The solids just simply settled to the bottom of that section and plugged the pipe until the suction head was so great that the pump wouldn't pump. Um, this is still in progress. I don't know whether we're going to get them to repipe this or until they actually need some of the flow, they may just leave this unit offline. Um, I want to spend some time looking at pump curves. James has done that some, but um, let's just do some basics here. The, the curve that slopes from the left and up to the right is your system curve. That's the head you're pumping against. The vertical distance at, at the left is your static head, and then the sloping portion is what's being caused, the head being caused by friction. The curve that slopes down and to the right is the pump curve. Where these two cross is the operating point. What I'm seeing a lot of is people say, okay, this is my system curve, this is my pump curve, here's where they cross, that's where they operate. And I've got some different conditions, I'll put on a VFD and just handle it from there. But when you install a VFD, you've got a full speed and then you've got a minimum speed curve. And if you've got any variation in your head, you also have a band there. So I've shown a curve that's the maximum static head and a curve that's the minimum static head. This might be minimum static head is when your wet well is completely full. Max static head is when you're basically at your shutoff elevation in the wet well. The operating point for this pump and this control system is everything I have shown in white. You've got to be able to operate in all of those conditions. The best way to do that is to get this drawn as two bands and then check the corners. If the corners work, the points in between will work. Um, this is a pump station I designed in um, 1998. It's 
three pumps pumping about three MGD. Um, the utility chose to keep pump number three in the lead position all the time. Their thought was, we'll wear out one pump and have to repair it while we're running other pumps. And, and then that's just for budget purposes, they chose to do that. Um, 13 years later, uh, so that was 2011, they in fact did wear out pump three, sent it to the manufacturer to be repaired, who gave them an estimate and then said, you know, you're 80% of the way to the cost of a new pump. And my new pump is a slightly different design. It's more efficient. Why don't we just do a new pump? And so they did that. And so here I've got max wet well level, min wax wet well level. The curve that goes lower is the original pump curve. The higher pump curve is the new pump. It is more efficient because it's flatter, but look what happens out at the left end. It doesn't extend all the way to the maximum wet well elevation. So when this wet well is at max wet well, minimum static head, this pump, let's go straight up to our power curve. The brake horsepower required exceeds nameplate, and they're going to burn this pump out. Well, when they reinstalled it, they had pump number two running in lead, number one is lag, and so pump three is now lag two. The wet well is full the first time they turn it on, and 13 minutes later, smoke came rolling out of that wet well. You've got to make sure that the pump curve extends all the way across your operating range. And we're going to talk later about making sure you know what your operating range is. This is a pump station um, pumping out in the collection system, um, basically a lift station pumping up and dumping into a new system. This is in a combined sewer overflow community. Uh, they needed to add something to deal with wet weather here. And so they decided at this location to add a wet weather storage basin and to lift into it they put a weir back into their original pump station and then build a second pump station that would go over to the wet weather storage unit. And then the problems, oh, and at the same time they were increasing capacity. So the original four pumps that were 12 MGD firm capacity became 18 MGD firm capacity. And then we start with the problems. At nighttime, one pump at minimum speed was all they needed. But what did the head of that pump look like? Here's the empty wet well and minimum speed. Follow those two curves back to the left and I've circled the problem. The minimum speed was less, the shutoff head at minimum speed was less than the static head of the empty wet well. This pump would just simply sit there and spin and heat up they burned out the seal between the pump and the bearing. In one spectacular case, they burned out that one. It didn't trip. They burned out the seal between the bearing and the uh, motor, at which point they burned out the motor. And the operator's description was, there is black goo coming out of the bottom of the VFD. Um, James made a comment to a minimum flow rate needed for pumps. Generally, if you look at a pump capacity, you're going to need at least 10% of that flowing just to keep the engine, the uh, pump cool enough. So this pump needs to have a minimum operating level so that it gets about 10% of its design flow. This needed to have a higher minimum speed. The fastest you can cycle a pump in a wet well is when the flow rate into the wet well equals one half of a pump capacity which was a condition for these, these pumps on the right are 10 MGD pumps. Um, and it was a fairly common condition to be sending 5 MGD over that weir. And the pump on the left, the, the left of those four pumps was always in the lead position. And it would cycle on, cycle off, cycle on. They were doing 13 starts an hour on a 10 MGD pump, which was designed for four starts per hour. They overheated it, burned out the pump. How might they have solved that? 
they could have just simply rotated the lead lag on these pumps and said the next pump on is the one that's been been off the longest and just move through these one two three four <clears throat> and put three starts on each pump rather than 12 starts on a single pump <clears throat> excuse me and then we get into the surcharged wet well condition the individual that designed this pump station did the pumps on the left thinking about the wet well up to the weir elevation and then he turned his attention to the pumps on the right he forgot that as the wet well level on the right came up it was going to continue to come up on the left and he winds up with this very complicated curve um, but let's start at the bottom we've got our two pump curves pump running at full speed and minimum speed the upper two system curves are full wet well and empty wet well we've got that diamond shape we talked about before that would have worked but when he let that water level come on up there's a third curve with a lower static head and that moves us past our brake horsepower limit on these pumps so brake horsepower is now greater than nameplate horsepower and all the time the pumps were in that red triangle they were burning out pumps which they did so with some regularity combining these problems this pump station was losing a pump or a starter on average every 25 days um, let's look at some power and control problems got to a pump station it was actually this same pump station uh, the spec said the VFD should be able to ramp from standstill to full speed and back to standstill in 120 seconds and you should set it initially to do that ramp in 60 seconds what happened in the field the VFDs never received the startup commissioning so the that ramp time stayed at the factory default to three seconds which meant the pumps went from zero to full speed or whatever their initial operating condition was in three seconds and worse for the pumps they went from full speed to locked rotor in three seconds it took 22 seconds for the check valve to close which meant on every pump cycle for 19 seconds water backflowed against a locked rotor and they literally tore the blades off of the impeller <clears throat> I run into this issue a lot and that's how you run multiple pumps on a VFD I'm using just a single system curve here we've got the solid lines are one pump running and two pumps running at full speed and the dash line is a pump running at minimum speed what you should do when you're running multiple pumps on VFD start at minimum speed come up to full speed when the second pump is called for slow the first pump bring the second pump up to that speed and then let the two ramp together why is that the right way to do it because if you take one pump and bring it up to full speed and then just turn on a second pump at a slow speed you can get this condition it doesn't start pumping over here at the left axis it starts pumping where it connects to the first pump curve and you see again a situation where this pump at minimum speed is not overcoming the system curve and this pump is pumping no water and it's heating up and they're going to burn out the seals so you want to move VFD pumps now this is a V these are VFD pumps that are connected to the same header if you've got pumps on parallel pipes that doesn't matter but if they're connected to the same discharge pressure so that the minimum speed pumps seeing the pressure from the full pump they need to be moving at, a, at the same speed this is um, a really common arrangement for a lift station you just can get to eliminate all of the valves you have a pump that pumps up and discharges into a free water surface in a head box and then it goes back out um, in the case of this station it was about 300 feet horizontally between the pumps and that head box 
and the pump cycle was programmed to run one pump on, higher elevation, two pumps on, higher elevation, three pumps on, and then they pumped all three pumps to a common low elevation and turned them on. Well, with 300, 350 feet of piping here, that piping drains in this setting since there's no valve, check valve. And by the time all three pipes drained, there was enough water in the wet well to call for a pump. And the control system called for a pump while the pumps were still back spinning from draining. And they took a power, a pump moving from being back spinning, free back spinning to powered forward. And they tore up the pump. How might they have solved this? In a control system, you could have done at you could have done staged off elevation so that you did a pump off, a pump off, and then the third pump off at a low elevation. And then if there was enough water there to start it, you would have a pump that was standing still to turn on. Uh, heat is a particular problem for a lot of our electronics. There was a station reporting problems. I went out there. The first clue, and I'm sure many of you have seen it, is the four foot diameter industrial fan in the doorway and the doorway in the other end of the room blowing and it's still 130 degrees in the MCC room, which was the case of this particular station. Um, the design mistake that was made is that a VFD controller will produce one ton of air conditioning demand for every 60 to 100 horsepower of VFD. Um, VFDs come in 6, 12, 18 pulse uh, designs. The six pulse units produce a ton of air conditioning for about every 60 horsepower, the 18 pulse for about every 100 horsepower. Um, and the process people forgot to tell the building mechanical people about that heat load. Our solution was adding five tons of air conditioning. Um, but also in a room, you'll have transformers that reject 5 to 8% of heat. MCCs also reject some heat. MCCs fail at 50 degrees C. Your PLCs fail, fail at 40 degrees C. We've got to keep these rooms cool enough. In most cases, this requires air conditioning, either the cabinets or uh, the room itself. And I think that's the end of my comments for today. Thank you, David. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have not already done so, please feel free to submit any questions you may have using the questions dialog box in your GoToWebinar control panel. And if possible, uh, indicate which speaker your question is, in is intended for. We're going to begin, though, with the three CEU questions uh, for operator credit, and then we'll move on to the audience's questions after that. The first question is, in a successful pump station design, net positive suction head required must always be greater than net positive suction head available. True or false? Uh, David, I'll let you respond. This item is false. Uh, it, it's actually backwards. Net positive suction head available must always be greater than net positive suction head required. Thank you. Uh, if a pump station does not provide sufficient capacity, the best solution is to always add additional pumps. True or false? David, I'll this pass one, it on to you. This is also false. Um, we might remember the flood pump station where the solution was giving uh, more cross-sectional area to the discharge piping um, and letting the pumps get back on their curves where they belonged. Um, the question says additional pumps. Another option might be actually to um, put in bigger pumps. You might be able to look at other conditions on the piping system and see if you can lower, lower the head. All right, and the third question is for James. Uh, multiple choice. Uh, when a pump is clogged or ragged up, will the amps on the motor be higher or lower than normal? 
Yeah, that one will be C. Depends depends on the location of the debris. Kind of like the example about the wear rings. If a pump has wear rings or a wear plate system, uh, impeller running against a wear plate. Essentially, what you're doing as you get rags between those wear rings or wear plate system is you're basically driving with your parking brake on. So that can just like driving with your parking brake on would need more horsepower, same thing with the pump, you need more amps. But if you have a blockage in your pump, typically your amps go lower, but they can be all over the place. So it really depends on the location of the debris. Great, thanks, James. Okay, we're gonna move on to some audience <clears throat> questions. And um, again, if you have any, please submit them uh, in the questions dialog box. Uh, question number one, when designing or operating a pump station with variable static head and VFD drives, what range of operating conditions must be considered? David, I think you kind of hit on this uh, in the presentation, so I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Yeah, the, the key is not only to think about the typical ranges, but, but the extreme ranges. What can happen in the extreme cases, either extreme low flow or extreme high flow. Um, and then the VFD adjustment needs to, to respond to what the system curve is doing and keep, keep the VFD at a speed that has the pump always pumping enough flow to keep it cool. But you need to, as in the example of the, the paired pump stations, you've got to make sure that one pump station isn't influencing the head of another. Um, and in some cases, we'll get into, um, on the discharge side, variable head. You'll see that not so much in wastewater, but in um, water distribution, where they're pumping to elevated tanks that vary quite a bit. You've got to make sure that you've got the extreme conditions. OK, next question we have here. I guess, uh, James, I think this one kind of falls falls on you. Uh, what is shutoff pressure, and can you talk a little bit about how it can be used for diagnosing pump issues? Sure. Shutoff pressure is essentially the, the max pressure that the pump can put out. And it's it's good to use caution when measuring this. Obviously, if you have a very, very big pump that can put out a really high shutoff pressure, say a very steep curve or very high RPM, you wanna make sure you don't blow up your piping, essentially. So use caution when, when measuring it, but it can lead to a lot of different things and, and basically give you a good indication of how your pump is operating and how it's not operating. For instance, if your pump wasn't seated properly on the floor, on the elbow, your shutoff pressure would be lower than it should be, or if it was clogged, lower than it should be. And so it gives you good indication of uh, gives you good indication of how your pump is performing, and you can also compare it to your actual pump curve to help troubleshoot in the field. So it gives you quite a few um, different ways of of eliminating a bad check valve, for instance, and other things in the wet well um, that that can cause issues. Okay, and one more question. <clears throat> what is the likely failure mode of a pump as the operating point moves far to the right end of the curve? David, can you hit on that? I think in all of those examples I showed, um, generally as you move to the right, the horsepower draw increases and at some point your um, power draw exceeds the capacity of the motor and you're going to you're going to fail the motor. Okay. Well, thank you. I don't see any other questions uh, posted at the time. So this will conclude our webinar for today, and we hope you enjoyed the presentations. Uh, if you'd like to look, uh, take another look at today's webinar, it can be downloaded from the WEAT website at the URL shown uh, on your screen within the next three days. I'd like to once again thank our two presenters for supporting WEAT and for all the work that they put in in preparing uh, for the webinar. Thank you, gentlemen. One other announcement, uh, the Wheat Collections Committee will be hosting our annual collection system conference 
on January 16th, 17th, 2018 at the Embassy Suites in San Marcos. Uh, it's going to be titled, or the, uh, the conference will be titled, Back to the Basics, Collection System O&M in a World of Innovation. Well, our committee will also be sending out a call for abstract submissions for the conference uh, this summer via email. And um, <clears throat> you could also, I guess it'll also be announced on, on the WEAT calendar page, which is www.wheat.org forward slash calendar dot shtml. Thank you to everyone who participated in the webinar and for supporting WEAT. We hope you all enjoyed it. And Logan? Yes. This is Julie in the WEED office. Just wanted to alert you to one late coming question. If you want to check the chat box and uh, push that out to our presenters sure. or I can. Okay. All right. It says, why would you ever design a system without a check valve on the pump discharge? David, do you want to take a shot at that? If you're doing a true lift where you're just Picking it up and dropping it over the the wall, um, it saves you um, the check valve. Um, a place where you'll see this quite commonly is when you're using a um, mixed flow axial pump that's just pumping up and discharging over. Um, I'm currently looking at a 600 MGD pump station that they want to double in size. And check valves don't come that big. Um, but it, it's a cost savings, a simplicity. If you're doing a true lift, it's kind of odd to do it where you've got much pipe at all hooked to the discharge. All right. Thank you, David. So again, I think it uh, looks like we have no more questions. So thank you to everyone who participated, and we'll see you all on the next webinar.